Welcome to Endo Battery, where we are sharing our endometriosis journey and learning along the way. This podcast is in no way meant to diagnose or give medical advice, but a place where you can gain knowledge and information that can help you to not feel alone as well as become your best advocate. We want to learn with you and support you wherever you are in your journey. Thanks for joining us. I'm Shelby. And I'm Alana, and we're Endo Battery, charging our life when Endo drains us. Welcome back, Endo Battery. Today, we are going to have fun because that's what we do here. And we have the honor of joining forces with Dr. LaRiche, Dr. Duke, who formerly known in our world as Eurobro, Endo Bro, and then as well as Chelsea is here to join us. And we are just going to go over kind of the summit and the experiences we had and the benefits of having both the patients, the doctors, and all the different practitioners. So buckle your seatbelts. Let's go, people. <laughs> going to be a ride. <laughs> Thanks, guys, for joining us today and taking the time to do it. Yeah. Thanks for having us. Yeah. yeah. You, you forgot one uh, group of people in your list of people who were at the end of summit. Who did I forget? The, the advocate. Advocate. That's yeah, well, advocate. she said That's fire. true. That's everybody. But what about the advocates? That's you guys. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, we're advocates, but we're also patients. But actually, there are advocates there because there were Mike, a lot of advocates. Yeah, there mm-hmm. were a lot. Mm-hmm. Mike Baker showed up by himself. Yeah, as an advocate, I and I was like, "Yep, yeah, high five. Yeah. He was awesome." Mm-hmm. Yeah. So Mike runs uh, Heritage Health, which is a chain of clinics here in Northern Idaho. That's it's like a not for profit, but they they tend to see more of the patients who are maybe underinsured or uninsured, and they run series of clinics for those uh, primary care clinics. And Mike doesn't mind me sharing, but Mike's daughter suffers pretty terribly from endometriosis. Yeah. So that's why Mike decided to make the journey. But Mike's a, Mike's a really good guy, for mm-hmm. sure. He's so, a stellar guy. Yeah, he is. And so. a fantastic dad. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He's great a dad. good dad. He's a great dad. Yeah. yeah. He, it was interesting. We had him and his family on, his wife and daughter on. And it was... Oh, really? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that hasn't... Mm-hmm launched yet but yeah and um she it's interesting to see her response to having her dad be so public with it and now they're like we're going back to the summit next year because they're all gonna come they're all coming yep yep so so good yeah Yeah. so it'll be good good yeah it was it was good because i i we like walked in and i totally was like these i'm afraid of doctors even walking into the summit i was afraid of doctors i was like i don't i don't think i can talk to doctors (laughs) yeah (laughs) Well, I'm I'm afraid of other doctors too, and we can get into that in a little bit. But I mean, I where I am, um, and I think a lot of one of the reasons the endometriosis summit is so important is because it is kind of a reset for me to be around other people who recognize that I'm doing an okay job. Um, mm-hmm. Because unfortunately, in the endometriosis world, it's very lonely. Even a, you know, I as a patient, it's very lonely. Obviously, I mean, that's like so much of what we discussed at the end of summit, but for endometriosis surgeons, it's actually a very lonely world because you're out there doing what you know is right. Mm -hmm. And you're constantly criticized for it. You're castigated. If God forbid you have a complication, everybody jumps all over you uh, because the types of surgeries you're doing are not the standard of care. The standard of care is just hormone, 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 Mm -hmm. fulguration, hormone, 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 fulguration, hysterectomy, ophorectomy, You know, and so excision surgery is, it's like this new world that we operate in. And so it is kind of nice to be in that, in that endometriosis summit world where like you're around like-minded people and that's really important. And paradoxically, right. When you do the right thing, meaning when you do endosurgery the right way, where you excise, where you work within the confines of a multi-specialty team, where you sort of know what you can and can't tackle, right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, paradoxically doing the right surgery there the first time Mm -hmm. is much better than the standard of care, quote unquote. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. So, and I agree with you with Adam, you know, like if you don't show up once a year and see the patients, the advocates, the other doctors, the family members of patients who have, have sought out care or are seeking care, you sort of lose track of your, Compass, because everybody's telling you you're doing the wrong thing all the time. And so so it's very, very, but I agree with that. I'm 100%. Paradoxically, I seem to be using that word a lot today, but it's a big word. Yeah. 
yeah. clear what's up with that. But I have a urology meeting, like the national and international urology meeting that's coming up at the end of the month. And the Endo Summit won an award there for patient advocacy. So they're they're actually presenting some stuff there. Guess how many other presentations in an international conference over four days have to do with endometriosis? Zero. Zero. Correct. <laughs> Guess how many have to do with pelvic pain in general? One. 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 Mm-hmm. Guess how many have to do with pelvic pain in women? <laughs> Zero. 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 <laughs> it's unreal. It's unreal, right? So, right. so the Endo Summit is sort of the only avenue that I get to see sort of all of my people. I call them my people, right? My, yeah. my yeah. co-workers, my thought leaders, my patients, my, my advocates, my families. That's the only time you get to do it because there are other endometriosis conferences, mm-hmm. but none of them incorporate everybody the way that they no, know something. No, I mean, I go to AAGL. Uh, actually, you know, I stopped going to AAGL. I haven't been to AAGL in three years. Uh, that's our our big, you know, minimally invasive gynecologic conference. And I stopped going because it doesn't recharge me the way that the endometriosis summit does. Mm-hmm. I go to the endometriosis summit and I come back feeling like I'm doing the right thing. Mm-hmm. And and there was this sense of, you know, it was so great being down there. And I got to see my mentor, Scott Fur was down there. And I got to see Shanti Moling, who I trained yeah. with, and, and Eve, and you know, Delumba and, and Ken and just everybody, Andrea, people that I respect the hell out of right. and that I look up to, you know, David, uh, Redwine in, in mm-hmm. this world and people who are out there and they've always been kind of the rebels. Like they've always been seen as like what they're doing is, you know, not the standard of care. And here I am in, in small town, Northern Idaho and Everything I do is constantly criticized. Uh, if I, you know, like I said, if God forbid I have any sort of complication, no matter how minor it is, it's I've got everybody kind of jumping all over. And it was so nice to be down there and and just be around those people. And when I got back to Idaho, well, I got back, I flew into the Spokane airport and I landed at like 10, you know, 10, 15 at night. It's about a 45 minute drive. And so there was really no one else on the road. And I was just kind of alone with my thoughts. And there was like this almost sinking feeling, like driving mm. back to Coeur d'Alene mm. from the airport after having this, you know, being there for, for three days with just and feeling so energized and yeah. feeling so alive. I mean, uh, talking with patients, talking with advocates, talking with people who are as passionate about endometriosis as I am. And it was hard. I mean, driving home, just like the only car on the freeway, just like, Ugh, I got to go back where mm-hmm. everything I do is, is not the standard of care. It's, it's not, it, what I'm doing is like crazy voodoo, um, radical, unnecessary surgery. I hear that a lot. Well, he does unnecessary surgery, you know? Um, so it's just, it's just such a paradox, you know, <laughs> you know, it's just such a, a weird, and that's why like, I feel so energized by the endometriosis summit and it's not just seeing the other doctors, it's seeing the physical therapists. Mm -hmm. And I think I'm so passionate. (laughs) I think I'm so passionate about endometriosis (laughs) that I've turned so many of my patients into advocates. I get calls Mm -hmm. all the time from my patients like, Hey, what can I do? What can Mm -hmm. I do? What can I do? And like at the endometriosis summit, I had two patients who showed up from uh, Helena, Montana, (laughs) Um, because they're there and they were there last year as well. And they're there because they are so passionate now and they're coming down to Florida from Helena, Montana Mm -hmm. to be around this energy that Sally and Andrea have created. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the only word for it. It's energy. Yeah. Energy energy and community, right? Yeah. So, so community is important because if you see that your name, what your neighbor is doing, right. You aspire mm-hmm. to, you know, if your lawn is not as nice as your neighbor's, you're going to try to make your, na- your your lawn a little nicer. And so we all sort of strive for excellence. And at the same time, we're all held accountable together in the same room by those same mm-hmm. patients and providers and, yeah. and advocates. So, yeah, Adam, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I didn't feel the same deflating sense that you did. Maybe it's because I didn't land in Idaho. Yeah. <laughs> There's uh, that. Yeah. New Jersey. Whoa. <laughs> What do you do? Jersey has better uh, restaurants, though. 
<laughs> well, I haven't been to cool. Idaho in a while, so that could be. <laughs> Coeur d'Alene's nice. Coeur d'Alene. Oh, okay. no, I mean, it was more just it was more just the, the deflating feeling of just I feel like I'm going back to a place where I am now alone. Right? Yeah, the solitude that, of that it. That was what it, yeah. it wasn't. It wasn't, yeah. you know, it yeah. was just like. I am now, after being surrounded by people that understand what I do, that actually think I'm good at what I do. That's the mm-hmm. coolest part. Like being down there and talking to physical therapists and patients and other doctors, like, yeah, we've seen your surgical videos. We've you, we've seen your outcomes. Like you're mm-hmm. you're actually good at this. Mm-hmm. And then coming back to a place where it's like, you're not good at this. Yeah. You're 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 not you're not special. You're not good at this. You have complications. You're not doing the standard of care. Everybody just needs to be on hormones. Yeah. Uh, everybody needs a hysterectomy. That's the deflating feeling. Yeah, but Adam, you know, nobody talks about the fact you put somebody on hormones, they get a DVT and a PE, right? That's that's not a complication, right? right? That's right. A right. <laughs> you, 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 uh, you give a, a, a 20-something-year-old irreversible infertility with right. hormones and castration. No, no, no big deal. That, right. That's, right. That's, mm-hmm. that's, you, know, you do a hysterectomy and cause the patient A to B, you know, permanently sterilized. You cause them pelvic pain, chronic pelvic pain, and truly and unsafely, right? Because remember, the general gynecologist who's actually practicing the standard of care has the highest rate of complications of any other surgery in the entire world. Look at the, just look at the malpractice insurance premiums. That's all you need to know. <laughs> yeah. uh, and you go, all right, well, who, who here is doing the right thing, right? Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. you know, Adam, and I, I think you're in a really unique sort of situation where you're alone, but you're truly alone in that state where you have right. nobody mm-hmm. to rely on. And I, I feel badly for you. So, but that's why you have uh, friends on speed dial, you know, you can always pick up the right. phone. And- right. But and I think- I've got my partner. I mean, my partner, Dr. Young is a, she's a really terrific endosurgeon as well. And, and, and slowly, I think the tide is turning. I think, you know, when I retire, whenever, you know, hopefully soon, um, <laughs> um, I, I think that we've changed enough minds. I think enough, mm-hmm. enough of the general surgeons, enough of the urologists have, have seen what I do. And they're like, okay, he's actually getting rid of the disease. This is, you know, and, and, and they are, they are, I'm not trying to like, you know, bash on anybody by any sense of the means, but I think that the tide is turning even up here slowly. I mean, it's, it's a big ship that we're trying to, you know, slowly turn around and it's not happening very quickly. But I think that the more that patients and advocates and phys- it's uh, up here where we are, it's, it's mostly the physical therapists who are leading the charge, mm-hmm. you know. You know, remember the, the inertia in medicine in general is a tough ship to steer in a different direction, mm-hmm. right? So I'll give you a little story. So, you know, I work with Andrea Vidali, obviously, yeah. as a multidisciplinary team, but I also work with uh, Laura Liu, um, right. who, if you recognize the last name, her father, C.Y. Liu, who I, get to op- I got to operate with when I was an intern in general surgery, believe it or not. I, so that's I trained with C.Y. Yeah, so there you go. So I was in, so, you know, C.Y., by you know not by a stretch is one of the fathers of minimally invasive surgery absolutely now, right mm-hmm. i can tell you with certainty i haven't spoken to cy he was ridiculed and called mm-hmm. crazy for doing mm-hmm. laparoscopy right yep and it took a long time for that to become the standard of care yep. to do laparoscopic surgery the same thing is happening now sort of with the transition to the robot and to talk to many of the gynecologists will tell you, no, 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 laparoscopy is the way to go. But, you know, there's, the field is moving forward. The technology is moving forward. The understanding of the de- disease is not, mm-hmm. right? right? And mm-hmm. so, because that's a much slower thing to evolve, mm-hmm. much slower. And that, you know, requires a group effort to move forward. And I, I wish you did go to AGL, Adam, truly. You know, I, I think yeah, uh, I mean, I, I'm going to go this year for sure. It's just it's just, you know, it's hard when I'm picking a conference to sort of go to it, it just for me, it makes more sense to go to the endometriosis summit because most of AGL is not dedicated to endometriosis care. And and if, if you're someone who does, you know, probably 90 percent endometriosis, I mean, I do some prolapse surgery and things like that, but I'm 90 percent endometriosis, you know, to go to a conference where it's maybe like 20% endometriosis. And, and I think the, the criticism maybe of those types of meetings is that what is being presented is still not as 
radical as what people like Andrea are doing and Scott Fur and and Ken and so you know there's still kind of this tendency to sort of like toe the line and be more conservative and um not really push for kind of these you know more uh radical type of surgeries the interesting thing about going back to CY I mean having worked with him and I didn't train a lot with him. He was kind of on the way out when I was there, but I did some really cool cases with CY. I mean, the dude is just unbelievable. I mean, he was born with a, it was like he was born with a, you know, a, a scope in his hand. He was brought before the medical board in the, in the nineties based on the other ob in town, sort of like basically saying he's not doing a standard of care. He, what he is doing is dangerous. It's reckless. It's irresponsible. And he had to go before the board of medicine who were trying to take away his license mm-hmm. for doing laparoscopic surgery. And, and, and that is just now. And look at where crazy. we are now. That's yeah. crazy. And that was just in like the mid nineties. It's mm-hmm. not that long ago. It's 25 years ago. Well, what's yeah, crazy, so, so. Adam, is like you talk about that island of isolation out there. But what's interesting is, is that you are giving hope to this region, specifically Pacific middle america because there's just not a lot like where we're at it's kind of yeah the same thing right not the midwest it's, yeah, it's, not, it's not the midwest here and the midwest well it's, i mean there yeah. are you know there are some, there are some great surgeons i mean sydney mossbrucker um is is over in gig harbor uh you've got nick fogelson and shanti right. in portland they're both you know amazing surgeons but if you uh, look more like rocky mountain like rocky mountain area yeah, it's like... no, i mean basically for colorado you've got uh, i think brian nelson yep yeah that's really kind of about it and, and then errington I've met brian, but i've heard great things i've heard he's a wonderful surgeon um but yeah i mean i i get patients from basically north and south dakota westward i mean mm-hmm. i montana wyoming north south dakota Idaho. I used to get a lot more from Utah, and then since uh, Mark Dassel has started, and then and then Jeff has gone back there. Uh, I don't see as many from Idaho or from Utah, excuse me. But I mean, it used to be just like you've got this huge, huge swath of the country that has nobody, mm-hmm. you know, and it's just it's crazy. Yeah, but I think it what is giving like you talk about it being isolating and going back onto that road home where it was kind of depressing in a way after yeah. coming because at the summit and we talked about this before but like you walk in and it instantly you have this community and I don't know what it is I think it's just the shared commonality but you walk in and you have these people who already see you who validate you and for us like that was for me at least I walked in and I was like wow I've never been to anything like this before Mm -hmm. And then when you leave, I mean, at least we left together, you know, you have, you're kind of one of the few in your area. So it's that mountaintop high to the mountaintop low, but the high for you would probably be you're helping people who have been invalidated themselves so many times you're now validating and they're not crazy, which validates you. Like it's this, it's such a great way of looking at we need you in this, in this area, the mountain plain, the Midwest. We need you in the Midwest. (laughs) Not the Midwest. Not the Midwest. I'm just, it's not the Midwest, but that was one of the jokes. It was one of the jokes. I a map of the United States. I know. I was like, oh my gosh. The Midwest. The Rocky Mountain region. But we need you in the, that's what I, I did say that, but. If you want to be in the Midwest, you can be. Yeah, no, and I'm not, I'm not like, I'm not trying to be like doom and gloom, like, you know, woe is me. It's it just, no, it's, it, is, it's it is an valid. isolating, it is, I, you know, when you're, when you're like kind of in the middle of nowhere, which I am, I mean, I mm-hmm. think, you know, there's a much bigger community in kind of that metro New York area, obviously, where there's very, very sort of, versions. you would think, right? But if you think about how many providers there are in the New York, New Jersey region for the number of people that are here, yeah, it's it's pretty much the same story as Ida. Look, guys, it's a national problem. This it is, is. Not an Ida. Oh, for true. sure. Yeah. Oh, 100 percent. Well, it, the fact it, that there how many doctors were there? What were there like 20 doctors? I don't know how many were there, but yeah, but it's all it's always the same doctors. Right. It's always the same. It's always the same doctors that are, are have been screaming from the mountaintops for, you know, 10, 15, 20 years now. And, and I think it would be great if somehow we could get like a 
you know, there are something like 70,000 ob mm-hmm. in America, and there's like less than 200 excision surgeons in the U.S. Like, it'd be great if somehow we could get like, you know, 10,000 ob in those rooms and hear those stories, hear the hear your stories, hear, hear from the physical therapist, hear mm-hmm. from the the urologists and the you know the general surgeons like Joe and like the the there really does need to be this collaborative multidisciplinary effort but I think more so just hearing from patients and hearing that the way that they've been treated it's horrific some of the stories you hear and Adam were you there uh, were you at the at the conference in Hoboken like one of the original oh yeah 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 do you remember there yeah there you go so. I think it was either the first or second year that we did the conference. We did an exercise where we put up a whiteboard and we had people come up and write sort of the craziest thing that they've sort mm-hmm. of. I remember, I remember that. It was. You remember that? Powerful. Yep. I cried. I mean, that was. I was cried ridiculous. too. Yeah. It was ridiculous. I cried too. Yeah. I, I sort of miss. I, I wish they'd do that again because I mm-hmm. think that that reinforces for me sort of that I'm doing the right thing by, mm-hmm. by all these people. You know, mm-hmm. hearing that these patients have been ridiculed or told they're crazy mm-hmm. or, or misguided, right, in some mm-hmm. way. I, actually, I, I think we're going to, I'm going to beg that they do that again next year because I think that's super important. It was very mm-hmm. powerful. There's a, there's a local provider here who tells every woman with pelvic pain that they must have been raped and not remembered it, that they've yeah. somehow suppressed the memory of being raped. and. Oh. Like that, that makes me want to cry right now because I see these patients in my <laughs> office every single day and they're like, I wasn't raped. I have pain. This right. is real. This is not, I'm not suppressing some memory. I wasn't raped. And, and it's like, I'm sorry, but it's so hard to hear no. day after day after day. of hearing these patients, their stories of like, you know, you're just depressed. It's in your head. It's mm-hmm. But like to tell a patient that the reason they had pain was because they were raped. Right. Are you fucking kidding me? Right. Right. It's just, oh, sorry. No, and, and I like, the thing is, is that that's not an isolated incident. No. Right. Yeah. That's, and that's what's multiple. infuriating about it. And so when we, for us that come to the summit, in a way, it's really healing to meet you guys because mm-hmm. you have the compassion and you have the, the, I don't know, you validate us, even though we've been like for us, we've already seen an excision specialist and have felt validated by that, that we aren't crazy, that the trauma wasn't caused by some outlandish thing. It was th- a disease. And so it was right. for me very healing to walk in that room and see the compassion that you all showed us. And <laughs> not only the compassion, but the passion, mm-hmm. like the passion that you have to do what you do is like nothing else I've seen. And I think that we need more compassion and passion, but I don't think that's going to happen unless other doctors hear these stories Mm -hmm. because anyone with a soul (laughs) that cares for people in chronic pain and hear this are going to be like, what are we doing wrong? We were talking to Jose about that, about even the, the provider empathy burnout. Mm Mm-hmm. And it's really, you guys see the worst of the worst and have to have the most empathy. But there's burnout with that too. What drives that? What fuels you to continue going? Because that's hard. You talk about seeing that day after day, but. Can I tell you, you know, I I don't know if I told you guys, I was in the army for for a couple of years in, in Israel. And the reason I bring that up is because that shared experience that you get with people who you've sort of been in the thick of things with. That shared experience is a bond that is for life, right? And is it's a very powerful bond, obviously, and it it energizes you to do all sorts of things when you are reminded of, you know, who what you're trying to do and what you're trying to accomplish. That for me is what the endometriosis summit sort of that's the hole that it fills in my life in a way Mm -hmm. that it it lets me have that shared experience with people who are in the trenches, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, on, on both sides, patient, provider, advocate, family, it, it doesn't matter. We're all sort of living a similar shared experience. And to me, that, that's an overwhelming sensation. It's, it's a powerful sensation, but it's a reinvigorating sensation. Mm-hmm. I don't get burned out by that. It's quite the opposite. I, I mm-hmm. sort of 
feel justified in doing what I do day in, day out yeah. from doing that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, the, the burnout thing is real. And I think for me, I'm a person who I'm working on it in, in, in therapy. Um, but I tend to focus on my bad outcomes. I tend to focus on the negative. I tend to focus on the surgeries, the patients that I didn't fix. And that's hard. I somehow seem to forget the 95 out of 100 patients who are significantly better. And I focus on like the five patients who maybe aren't better or occasionally sometimes worse. And it is hard. It's exhausting. And and then when you're met with outside criticism as well, um, you know, you, you've already got this internal criticism, like, am I really good at this? Uh, am I a good endometriosis surgeon? Can I do these cases? And then you're also, you know, you've got your own internal monologue where you're criticizing yourself constantly. I'm constantly I come home every day after surgery and like I had five surgeries today and usually Wednesday is like my sacred time. Like I come home and I don't want to talk to anybody. I don't want to text anybody. I, you know, I'll put my phone away and I put on a record and I just lay on my floor and listen to music and just, and just think like, what could I have done? What could I have done better? What could I, you know, is there a way that I, that I could have approached that differently? And, and it is, it is exhausting. I mean, it truly is. It, yeah, it's exhausting. But Adam, when you, yeah. when you do that, right. Cause I think every good surgeon goes through that. Yeah. Uh, you know, the self-flagellation and the self-doubt. Yeah. Cause yeah. that's the only way, but, but when you do identify something that you could do better yeah, and then implement it, and you do better. Isn't that the best feeling in the world? It is. It is. Yeah. And there are times, you know, I think like, oh, I should have done that. And then I go in the OR the next time and I do that, uh, or I'll, I'll take a slightly different approach to something and, and do it well. Yeah. So I wasn't, you know, I'm not trying to say that like, I'm, you know, constantly like, oh, you know, I'm just criticizing myself all the time, but it is a, I think the, the original point of discussion that we were making was that you know, this idea of empathy burnout and, and how do you sort of sustain this continuous, it, it does take a lot of energy. I mean, it, it does, you, you give a lot of yourself to your patients and you give a lot of your time and you give a lot of your heart to your patients. And it is, it is exhausting. And I could see how people could burn out. There are times when I sometimes feel that I'm like, oh, you know, what am I doing? You know, but the, I feel so energized by things like this, like mm-hmm. something as simple as this, like talking to you guys. And, and it just, it just makes me all, you know, like, yeah, I'm all excited again. And I, I constantly am watching like all the endo summit talks that Sally puts on and Andrea put on. And, and it does, it does. That's what energizes mm-hmm. me is mm-hmm. things like this. And the endo summit is just, I mean, for me, it's like, you know, just a three day, like, endorphin rush i mean it really is like it's just, it's just we don't endorphin. sleep no you don't you have sleep. to have the endorphin rush yeah, you don't you, sleep you don't sleep you're hanging out with other people yeah. who are like-minded you're hanging out with patients and and there's no there's no hierarchy at the end of and that's what's awesome like, well the surgeon the surgeons are over there the pts are over there the advocates are here the patients are we're all hanging out mm-hmm, everybody's right. hanging out at the pool at the restaurants at the events at the right and it's just that i mean it, it's just it's three days of just you know mainlining dopamine is what that is it's Mm -hmm. so fun it's so great i mean i know we left and i i mean i went there kind of a little timid and like oh we're doing this podcast you know like i i hope we're doing it justice i hope we're doing the right thing and we came back and we're like okay we're re-fired up again like it gave us the energy to keep doing what we're doing and putting the content out there that we're doing. And it's, Mm -hmm. it's interesting to see like the different variety of people that are there and how much we learn just from their little stories and from what they bring to the table. It's like everyone's sitting around this big round table and having this deep discussion and then you're getting fueled and and then you're laughing a lot. We laugh so much. Yeah. Like yeah, my face hurts. (laughs) I I was like, ah, I've been, we Part talking, of it might have been the sunburn, we but just, I have, you know. We were just talking about like today and stuff and just us talking about it. Like my face, we start laughing automatically. Like my face, I'm smiling. I'm like, my cheeks already hurt. Like, I don't even understand how we are not even talking to everybody yet. And we're already <laughs> laughing and having mm-hmm. a good time and you guys aren't even here yet. So right. yeah, it was. It got, it got much sadder once we showed up. 
<laughs> no, yeah, I, I felt like that like started. My whole point was to like get on and just talk about how amazing the end of some was and how we were all so energized and said I got on. I'm just like, oh, <laughs> well, but, but that what shows your you true do? compassion and does. passion, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, but no, I just I yeah, no, I, I think it's I think it's an incredibly important event. Um, you know, as long as Sally will have me, I'll keep. And even if she doesn't invite me, I'm going to just keep showing up. You're going to be the, so. the sad number outside the door. Yeah. <laughs> anything, anything yeah. for me. Yeah. It this was. Like, like, we like, should we'll uh, trade endo should... advice for tickets. <laughs> <laughs> I think we should put together a talk for AGL. I think the younger providers at the endo summit need to put together a talk for the AGL, of course. Yeah, I think that'd be great. Would AGL yeah. have patients there? Or advocates no. speak? Advocates, probably. Yeah, Susan Susan Richards gave a really powerful lecture. Uh, I don't know if you guys know Susan, but she's a kind of Pacific Northwest person. She's really close with Cindy Mossbrucker. And Susan's a, Susan's a wonderful person. She's a doctor, nurse practitioner, um, mm. but also an endometriosis patient who's been through the ringer. You know, mm -hmm. she had all the, the story, all the stories from everyone you've ever heard have also happened to Susan. And uh, Susan's great. And she gave a talk a number of years ago. It was very, very powerful. And like her own experience as a healthcare professional mm -hmm. who understands more about medicine than your average Joe. Mm -hmm. And and she was still continuously gaslighted and told mm -hmm. that what she was experiencing was not real. And she didn't really know what she was talking about. Like, sit down. We'll, we'll tell you how it's going to mm -hmm. be, sweetheart, you know, mm -hmm. kind of thing. So she gave a really powerful talk. So there are, I think there are opportunities for that, for sure. You know, we, I think we just have to be loud, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, we know how to be loud and the whole yeah. hotel heard us, but we weren't exactly quiet. <laughs> Chelsea, Chelsea, for sure. The whole hotel heard us. <laughs> yeah, Chelsea's the loudest voice in endometriosis. <laughs> yeah, I know. Literally. Especially know. after one cocktail, it's like... The entire hotel heard how you almost got abducted at Applebee's. <laughs> Thank goodness we had you guys with us. Or else well, like, you, Adam, you weren't there. there. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah you weren't there. For it. I yeah. was rooting for it. Yeah. You were rooting yeah. <laughs> That Whatever. Was Next. Uber Eats driver eating his customer's food at the same thing. Oh my gosh. That was weird. Yeah. Adam, did you hear about this? Oh, I heard all about it. Yeah. I, I heard. I heard Chelsea talking about it at the restaurant while I was at the hotel. <laughs> <laughs> it is so loud. So loud. Like, is that? Is that Chelsea? <laughs> I was, sitting, having a nice, I, can hear. I was having a, sitting and having a nice quiet drink with Shanti Molly, and I'm like, yeah. <laughs> that's <laughs> Chelsea. Somebody's I mean, yelling that's about Chelsea Uber Eats and almost getting Apple kidnapped. Beans. That was the funniest. Oh, my gosh. So just to give clarification for this, we went to Applebee's because it was late after we got back from Epcot, right? Is that after Epcot? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And we got back from Epcot, and a bunch of us hadn't eaten dinner, so we went over to Applebee's, and Chelsea and I were all sitting at the bar. They didn't want to seat us for like, 30 minutes or something. So we're just sitting at the bar and she is hoping and praying a crumb drops on her plate because she's so hungry. She's like, please, I'll just eat. Is that a cheese stick? I want a cheese stick. <laughs> you was really hungry. She was so hungry. So this, these two guys were sitting at the bar or whatever and they were in their own world and then this guy walks in and he's got like this button down polo with like the, I don't know how to, do, like golf shirt. Think like, or maybe not golf, maybe like office shirt. Comes in and she's like, what do you got in there? <laughs> what kind of food is in that what bag? What kind of food is in I that bag? I was ready to take food from a stranger. I was that hungry. <laughs> and, and he's like, oh, I don't know. Let's look. So he opens it up. And I'm thinking it's his food. And they're, the guy's next to him. And they're all talking about what high rollers they are. And he's like, yeah, I'm an attorney. And we talk about, you know, I, you know, I, I prosecute people in all these different states. He's talking about how much of a high roller he is. And then he's like, here, you want these uh, French fries? And he goes to hand Chelsea French fries. And she's like, no, no, yeah, I'm no, good. I'm not going to eat that. I'm not going to eat that out of his hands. Like, right. <laughs> it's not going to work. <laughs> and he goes, okay. So he shoves like this wad of French fries in his mouth and orders a drink and then pays for his drink and tips. And after he left, we were like, how much did he tip? How much did he tip? And how she's did like, the high roller big shot guy Right. $2 for his drink. And the bartender's like, well, no, the other guy like threw a hundred out and was like, here, we'll cover, we'll cover his, we'll cover his, you, we'll cover you his tip. You tip earned it better. And then he's like, oh, okay. He's like, yeah, he's an Uber driver. 
picking up Uber Eats picking food, Uber eating Eats. the Uber Eats food of his customers. It was an adventure. It well, was. Can I just say this in case Applebee's wants to be your corporate sponsor? It's a fine dining establishment. It was, it it was. a fine dining it, establishment. It, it was. They saved us that night. It wasn't necessarily them. That guy was just. And we had a really great bartender. The bartender he was really great. Was yeah. Pretty There's an Applebee's test. next to my kid's gymnastics place. And every single day after gymnastics, George wants to go eat at Applebee's. It's his favorite restaurant. It's a very quality establishment. Very. I mean, they serve apparently great mozzarella sticks. I wouldn't mm-hmm. know because I didn't get any. <laughs> I'm still kind of sad. <laughs> yeah, no, that was fun. It was Tune in next week for part two as we continue our discussion with Dr. Duke and Dr. LaRiche when we talk about the lack of education about endometriosis in medical school and what it might look like to improve the care for endometriosis patients moving forward. Until next time, remember to advocate for you and for those that you love. Thank you.